We are going to open a Marion County Board of Commissioners meeting. It's Wednesday, May 22nd, 2019. We're here in the St. Paul, City of St. Paul tonight in your community center. It's great to be with you, uh, community hall. And uh, for the record, we're at 20239 Main Street, Northeast St. Paul, Oregon. And um, we always start our board sessions with the Pledge of Allegiance. Right. So if you will join us, we'll do that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I didn't see they going to do it. I would say, I'm not going to uh, say anything negative about the Senator Hearing Room, or the Senator Hearing Room, mm -hmm. but that sounded so much better here with all of you tonight, saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you for, for uh, being great Americans. It's great to be here with you. Uh, we have nobody signed up for public comment. We will be doing, uh, before, um, uh, before Tracy comes up, I just want to go through a little bit of uh, what to expect tonight. Uh, we're going to do an official, we are an official board meeting. Uh, if anybody wants to make public comment about anything other than it's on our agenda, you're welcome to do that. However, we're going to go through uh, a normal board session, which shouldn't take us very long. When we're done with that, we will adjourn that board session and we will go into a town hall. And at that town hall, you can ask any questions you want. We, we're going to have a few presentations before we open it up for questions during the town hall. So if there's no objections, that's what we're going to go sail through. And it's great to be here with you tonight. So Tracy, if you'd like to come up and uh, say a few words, Tracy Fleck. And you can just sit right there. And the other thing, the other thing I would say is the microphones, when you are speaking tonight, are not projecting sound. So it's just our voices and however, the microphones are recording what we're saying. So when we get to questions and answers, I'll probably repeat your questions so that the microphone's picking up those questions and everybody can hear it. So welcome, Tracy. So if you thank can just you. speak into that microphone for yeah. recording purposes. And thank you for coming out and using the community hall. We have this wonderful facility, so it's nice that you guys are utilizing it. And welcome to all of the crowd and our um, important people in our world here in St. Paul that affect us and help us. And we love the partnership that takes place with um, each and every one of you. Uh, the Sheriff's Office, um, all of you sitting here that are representing us, it's very nice to have you out here and, and feel like we're part of, the, part of the important people out there that really need to sometimes get the notice to take care of some of the issues we have or the good things that we have. <laughs> so anyways, thank you very much and um, thank you for your partnership and we are so happy to have you here this evening. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> what, there is one other thing though, the most important person, where's Rachel? <laughs> Rachel, did you want to come up and say hello into the microphone? Oh, okay. Oh. I know, and, and your sister's playing softball so mom needs to probably take yeah. you and get going, right? Yeah. Well, so, thank you. Yeah, we'll, I'll be back. Yeah, she thank won't. you, Tracy. <laughs> thank all right. you. Rachel was very impressive. She told me there, all about her trip to There Disney she Island. is. Yes. Bye, Rachel. I'm sure you've heard all about it. Fantastic. All right. I uh, want to also welcome uh, city councilor. There's a couple of city councilors here. Uh, we have Councilor um, Velma Amaya Medina. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Peggy Sellers. There's Peggy, just taking care of Rachel over there. Welcome, Peggy. Peggy. And, our, and our new mayor, uh, who I just met tonight, Marty, Marty Waldo. Thank you for, very much for being here and opening up your town for us tonight. Appreciate your service. So we'll go right into our business. I don't know whose turn it is tonight. I think it's the new guy. It's, new guy's it's the new guy's turn to do the consent calendar. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the consent calendar. Under the assessor's office, approve a resolution for the fiscal year 2019-20 county assessment function funding assistant grant amendment. Under uh, Board of Commissioners OLCC application, recommend approval of Awesome Indoor Playground Salem LLC, DBA Awesome Indoor Playground Salem, Oregon, Annette Day Enterprises Incorporated, DBA Route 99 in Salem, Oregon. 
uh, approve a resolution for establishing a continuum of care for the mid Willamette region of Marion County. Under finance, approve an order appointing Jeff White, Marion County Chief <coughs> Financial Officer, as the cable officer for the mid Willamette Valley Cable Regulatory Commission. Under Health and Human Services, approve Amendment Number 17 with the Oregon Health Authority to remove $32,693 in maternal, child, and adolescent health Title V funds for the 2017-2019 Intergovernmental Agreement for Financing of Public Health Services. Under Public Works, approve the Public Improvement Agreement with North Santiam Paving Company for $1,631,791 for the Winter Creek Road Construction Project. And under the Treasurer's Office, approve an order distributing Oregon State Forestry Timber Revenue as per ORS Chapter 530. I'll well, second. Just a little comment that Winter Creek Road, I don't want to give people the wrong impression, but this is one where we're actually at a rotary meeting. People came up to me and said, this road is terrible. Can't you do something? It went to Public Works. They looked at it and must have agreed. And of course, it took two years, but it's being done. So I'm always pleased to see that it makes some gains. If I didn't, I'll second the motion. Here we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, so the consent calendar is done. We'll move into action. The first action item is to consider approval of a proclamation designating the month of May as Older Americans Month whoa, whoa, in whoa, Marion whoa. County. <laughs> you know, that's kind of illegal today. Judy, know that. Judy and... Chuck, I haven't seen you in a while. It's good to yeah. have you here been a today. while. Yeah. We like to come in and watch you work. Oh, yes. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, commissioners, for allowing us this time to talk about what we feel is a very important issue. Every May, um, the federal government, uh, again, re-endorses and calls May the Older American Month. Uh, the Older American Act was written up in about 1960, and it covers many, many fine programs that our tax dollars don't quite do. Uh, one of the biggest programs, commissioners, that is most well known, of course, is Meals on Wheels. There are many, many people that would not be eating, and um, the Meals on Wheels is predominantly paid for by the Older American Act funds. This is due to federal uh, funds, and every year we have to go back to the federal government, put out our little hands and beg a little bit more, but every year we seem to get it back, and we're very fortunate, but who knows what will happen next year. So in thinking about this, it, the Older American Act doesn't just cover Meals on Wheels. It covers many other little programs that cover um, uh, older Americans and the disabled. It covers them in areas that perhaps would fall through the cracks. Little programs that um, help mental illness, little programs that, that help people uh, become uh, more active in life, get their, get their physical bodies back in shape so that they don't have falls and they don't end up back in the hospital. So there are a lot of programs that this little, this little fund helps and we wanna see Marion County sign off on the Older American Act may as being the proclamation for this particular act. It would make us very proud to know that out, once again, that we live in the finest county in Oregon. I like the sound of that. Uh, this is the boss, I just want to uh -huh. make that clear. But I, I've been fortunate too. For the last 10 years, I've Pull worked- Pull microphone just a little oh, bit. Sorry. The last- Ten years I've worked with Northwest Senior Services. I'm on their senior board. And you have no idea how many things that you deal with and how many different subjects you have to cover. But uh, it's been a real joy. And when I retired, I couldn't decide what to do. And I knew that people that went home and sat and watched television died. So I decided I wanted to stay busy. Well, it got out of hand, I gotta warn you. Uh, I see right now I have three boards that I work on. I work with vet voc rehab, I work with independent living, and I work with, uh, I've got a new one, just came along the other day. I'm now Metropolitan uh, Transportation for Marion County, so yeah, it's been really a, a blessing. But working for the seniors is a different world, and, and uh, 
St. Paul is a very nice spot because I hear a lot of nice things about the way this town will come in and take care of other people when they need it. So we try to do the same thing. Thank you. Great. Thank you both for your service. And uh, we will, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to approve the proclamation and then we'll, we will read it out loud. Will we be doing that today? We're going to do that for you right now. Oh, great. We might have a signed copy. Yeah, well, we might have a signed copy for you. Right. Okay, but we're not going to sign it until we actually approve it. Okay? I, I do have some comments, but right. I'll, I'll make a motion. That first of all, we approve a proclamation that designates the month of May as Older Americans Month in Marion County. And uh, Judy and Chuck, they said a couple things here to tell you how involved they are, but I've, I serve on a senior service board, but I just try to, I just try to keep up. They do all these different programs in, but these two, uh, they've been at it for years. They know everything that's going on. And as much as I hate going into our state capitol, every time I'm there, I see them. They're lobbying for one important bill after another. So they get things done, uh, know people, and so active. And I certainly do appreciate all your efforts. And then just getting selected. He didn't sound like the same thing, but the transit board is a reconstituted board in uh, Salem for the transit service. Some services coming out into rural Marion County, uh, but we've, we've, they needed an overhaul, and I'm so happy that you'll be there to, to try to make things work. Thank so, you, Commissioner. We appreciate you. that. I just have to add one thing. We're not lobbyists. <laughs> I didn't say you were. I said <laughs> we're, we're, we're advocates. You're, you're educators. Yes. Very good. I guess I'm correct that I didn't mean to be. So <laughs> I made a motion. You did make a motion? I did. Mr. Chair, I'll second the motion, but I also want to say I, I got the chance to go. Wait, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? No. no. Yeah. <laughs> I got the chance to go to their budget committee uh, meeting the other day, and it was the best budget meeting I've been in. Thank you. And I, we go to a lot of budget meetings in this business, but um, I think it was scheduled for an hour and a half, mm -hmm. and we were done in 45 minutes. <laughs> and the presentation was very specific every line item they explained exactly what it was where the money was going uh, it was it was absolutely phenomenal we so. have incredible staff at northwest senior disability services very impressive mm -hmm. well fantastic we have a motion a second any further discussion seeing none all those in favor of approving the proclamation signify by saying aye 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 and we will read the proclamation you sure you want to start please in a matter of recognizing May 2019 as Older Americans Month in Marion County Proclamation, whereas the citizens of Marion County include numerous older Americans who enrich and strengthen our community, and whereas Marion County is committed to engaging and supporting older adults, their families and caregivers, and acknowledging their many ongoing valuable contributions to society, and whereas we acknowledge the importance of taking part in activities that promote physical, mental, and emotional well-being no matter one's age, and whereas Marion County can enrich the lives of older individuals in our community by promoting home and community-based services that support independent living, involving older adults in community events and other activities, and providing opportunities for older adults to work, volunteer, learn, lead, and mentor. Now, therefore, the Marion County Board of Commissioners does hereby <laughs> proclaim May 2019 as Older Americans Month. We urge citizens to take time during this month to recognize older adults and the people who serve them as vital parts of our community. Signed and dated this 22nd day of May 2019 at St. Paul, Oregon. We will sign that proclamation and we're going to give you a copy of that. Thank you. And, thank you. And uh, Judy and Chuck, thank you. For, I know my relationship with you goes back many years when I was in the state, state house and I appreciate all the work you did then and continue to do. So. But they weren't lobbying you. <laughs> they were educating. They were <laughs> educating me. Right. And I'm a hard one to educate, right? <laughs> well, thank you once again. We really appreciate Marion County Commissioners, and we really appreciate St. Paul for having us here. I'll give them one. Colleen, you want a picture? Judy, don't Here. leave yet. Right here, this is 
Thank you, Mike. Our next item is also under Board of Commissioners, is consider approval of a resolution establishing Marion County's dedication to an accurate and complete 2020 census. And Lisa Trowerneck from our office is here to present. Thank you, Commissioner. Good evening. Um, 2020 is coming quickly. It seems like our census is far off, but uh, April 1st, 2020 is Census Day. And we're trying to get the word out across the, the county. Uh, we're working with our federal and state representatives. We're partnering with all of our cities throughout the county to make sure that we are really promoting um, getting an accurate count. Um, 2020, April 2020 is also Commissioner Cameron's birthday, so it's a special day that we're going to celebrate. That's really important. <laughs> April 1st, 2020. Um, so, I'm here tonight to let you all know about the census and ask you if you would help us participate in getting the word out, promoting an accurate count. And then also um, we have a resolution before the board to consider, um, consider signing, approving the resolution to um, proclaim that Marion County is committed to this uh, accurate count. There's a flyer here that um, is on the table that will explain about the census. Essentially, we get about a billion dollars every year to Marion County in state <coughs> and federal funds uh, that's based on our census numbers. So we know that Marion County has grown in the last 10 years. We only get this count every 10 years. And so um, the importance is there because the funds that come uh, um, are related to funding for Medicare, Medicaid, transportation, schools, housing, all of the early childhood programs. All of the things that really impact our community are based on the, the census numbers. And so it is really important that our communities are aware of this. Um, we have some areas in Marion County that are hard to count communities. And those areas, we're going to do a really um, big outreach to, we're partnering with our um, nonprofit stakeholders in throughout the county to really reach out and let people know the importance of the census and the importance to our local communities. It's very important to our local community. It seems like it's a, you know, a federal thing. It is mandated by the um, Constitution, um, but it also does really impact our local community. The county is partnering with uh, the cities and the state, and we're cr we've created a complete count committee. And anybody that's interested in participating with our Marion County Complete Count Committee, I'd ask you to please sign up. There's some yellow sheets on the table over here. Um, we have a website, it's mccounts.com, um, Marion County Counts, mccounts.com. And um, if you'll sign up, let us know that you're interested, contact me. Um, my information is there as well, and we will keep you involved as we go through the planning. And um, we're going to be really asking a gra for a grassroots effort to get out to the community to let people know about the importance and um, how it impacts our community. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. um, so ba basically the thing here is that anybody wants to volunteer to help uh, with getting the right count. Uh, one of the things I will say about this is uh, uh, the state of California is going to spend, I, I believe they had $90 million approved and then they, I think they allocated another $130 million. So if you think the state of California is spending $220 million to get their count right, you know it's important, right? That it, it really is important. And Lisa mentioned a billion dollars that comes back to Marion County. I whispered to Sam, I said, that doesn't show up in our budget. 
right? That's, that's all the monies that flow through schools and all kinds of places, mm -hmm. cities, wherever it is, uh, infrastructure, ODOT. So that's just the types of funds that come back. So it's really important that we get the, the uh, census right, not only in our county, but in our state for the federal government to be right. So uh, we, can, we can take a motion and we can have further discussion if we want. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve a resolution establishing Marion County's dedication to an accurate and complete 2020 census. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Just a couple of examples. Uh, when I was mayor of Sublimity, uh, we felt like they missed our biggest uh, senior residence was the Marion Estates, and it was just about that amount of people that were short. And it, it cost the city, I'm trying to remember the number, but a substantial amount of money for, mm -hmm. for the next 10 years. So you've got to get it right. And then Idana has had trouble with their, with their count and, and income and their income levels. They're not right. They're showing as a, a high price spread in Marion County. Well, we know they're not. And it's kept them from getting different grants and assistance that they should have. So just to, as examples of why that accuracy is important. Great. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the resolution signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. We'll look forward to April 1st, 2020. It's a special day. Yes. Um, our next action item and last action item on the agenda tonight is under Public Works to consider approval of an intergovernment agreement for incoming funds with Polk County and Yamhill County for $525,000. Marion County to be the lead agency in a cooperative program for collection and management of household hazardous waste. Brian May is here. Brian, welcome. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, for the record, Brian May, Public Works Environmental Services Division. Um, yeah, before you, kind of a unique opportunity here where we get to talk a little bit about incoming funds uh, with an intergovernmental agreement. But I want to give you a little background to this. Um, it's all kind of based on our household hazardous waste facility that's located out on uh, Highway 22 east of I-5 kind of heading up the canyon from Salem. Um, this facility was constructed in 2004 and opened in 2005. My date's straight here. Uh, before that, we had to operate on what we call satellite events where we'd try to open on a Saturday, have people come in, we'd collect this hazardous waste. Um, we were really wanting to look for a better way to do this properly. Uh, the facility uh, provides a unique opportunity for us. We're open every Thursday and every other Saturday. This is a free service to Marion County residents. Uh, last year we had almost 3,400 customers take advantage of that. Of that makeup, almost 95% of that is Marion County residents. We have a little bit of Polk County customers and a little bit of Yam Hill and Lynn County, but otherwise it's, it's ourselves taking care of this. Um, they dropped off almost 220,000 pounds of hazardous waste. So that's a big improvement for our environment to keep that out of our landfills and then also out of our incinerator. We don't want to have that emissions going up. So we're doing a great job along that line. So customers are taking more advantage of that. We're seeing about a 20% increase year over year in the use of the facility. Um, this agreement takes us kind of the next level uh, with Polk County and Yamhill County. Um, it updates our costing string. Um, the agreement allows us to charge Polk County customers, actually back to Polk County themselves and not the customer directly, about $74 per person. Um, the customer themselves won't see the bill when they come in, that just goes back to their county. Uh, but it allows for continuous operation of the facility. It costs us a little over $350,000 a year to operate this facility. Um, we're very excited to have this. It's kind of unique to have one of these uh, within our jurisdiction. Um, and we appreciate the cooperation with Polk and Yamhill counties uh, in the endeavor. They've also provided a forklift and some satellite trucks for other satellite events where we try to hit more remote portions of Yamhill and Polk counties. But overall, it's been a, a very successful program for us. Um, this agreement will give us uh, five years with a one-year option to continue. Um, and we're excited to, to bring it forward for your approval. Great. Right yeah, Sam. Brian, I just may not have heard you as I was reading stuff, but are there permanent sites in either Polk or Yam Hill where they do any collection? There are not. So it's no. all, well, all satellite events, all right. yes. And then I just, there's got to be a story here. I heard you mention the forklift that says remove ref references to having Polk County uh, do pub, uh, for maintenance. 
Uh, I'd like a little something with Commissioner Pope. They didn't do a good job, did they? Actually, they, they did a good job oh. for us here. <laughs> um, no, they, they definitely stepped up and provided the equipment for the initial rollout of the HHW facility. So uh, we appreciate their involvement. I thought you so. took it out because it wasn't working. <laughs> so. better I can make a better story out of this. Yeah. So, 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 Brian, I have a, a question. Knowing where the facility is and for, for the residents of St. Paul, Obviously, if they're going to go to transfer station, they're probably going to go to our Woodburn transfer station. Correct. This is in our uh, Salem uh, transfer transfer station. Uh, when you go in there, you go into that place on Saturday or on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Are they going to ask me for my ID? How do they How do they track what, what county I'm from? Um, it, it's just like going to one of our transfer stations they ask for me disposal. My zip code. They'll just ask you for your zip code, and, and that's just for our tracking purposes, kind of see where everybody's coming from geographically. Um, if you are coming from Polk County and, and you give us a Polk County zip code, that's where we'll record that information and give that back and, and bill Polk County for that. So 9730 what is it, eight or six? Here's, yep. West Salem. West Salem, yep. Oh, four, yeah. Mm hmm Okay. Any questions, Commissioner? No, I'm good. All right. And Chair Cameron, I'd make a motion that we do approve the intergovernmental agreement for incoming funds with Polk County and Yamhill County for $525,000, Marion County to be the lead agency in a cooperative program for collection management of household hazardous waste. Second the motion. A motion and second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Brian, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes our business. We will read the calendar of all the places that we're going to be. You want to explain that? Yeah, so um, at the end of every meeting, we read the calendar. All of our meetings are public, so you're welcome to come to any meeting that we have. Uh, we read the calendar at the end of every one of our board sessions so that you know where we're going to be in the next week. So uh, today is Wednesday, so this already happened, so I better start tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow is uh, Thursday, May 23rd at 8.30 in the morning. We're going to have a meeting at the Positive Aurora Airport Management meeting. Uh, it's located at Willamette Aviation, 23115 Airport Road, Northeast in Aurora. And then at 11 a.m. tomorrow, May 23rd, we're going to have a Board, board of Commissioners Chief Administrative Officer meeting. Uh, and we're also going to have an executive session if needed pursuant to ORS 192.660. That's located in the Silverton Conference Room on the fifth floor of our building in Salem. That's 555 Court Street Northeast in Salem. On Monday, May 27th, uh, we're going to be closed in observance of Memorial Day. <laughs> Hope you all are too. Uh, on Tuesday, May 28th at 9.30 in the morning, we have a Community Corrections Board meeting located in the Silverton Conference Room on the fifth floor of our building. That's 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. Uh, at 10.30 a.m. on Tuesday, May 28th, we have Calendar Review located in the Silverton Conference Room on the fifth floor of our building, uh, 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. On Wednesday, May 29th at 9 in the morning, we have Board Session located in the Senator Hearing Room on the first floor of our building. Again, that's 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. On Wednesday, May 29th at 3 in the afternoon, we have a Marion County Extension and 4-H Budget Committee meeting where they will present the fiscal year 2019-2020 budget. And that's located in the Sovereign Conference Room on the fifth floor of our building, 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. And on Wednesday, May uh, 29th at 5.30 in the evening, there is a, De a Detroit Downstream Passage Project meeting located in the Gates Fire Hall at 140 East Sorbonne Street in Gates. And for uh, those of you who have been following this, this is the Army Corps of Engineers uh, project surrounding Detroit Lake. Um, they're trying to build a, a tower, a water mixing tower in the lake, and they're going to present uh, a new idea of how, how they're going to do that. So that's an important meeting for us, as their decisions there could have a big impact on Marion County. So. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and we're just signing a bunch of contracts up here, and then we'll be done here in just a second. Uh, why we're doing that, I think we have, we have several, um, I guess we could do it during the town hall introdu introductions, because some of our, your other elected officials are here. I saw our, our assessor walk in. Of course, nobody likes to see him, do they? <laughs> where, where are you, Tom? Tom, you want to, yeah, <laughs> Tom. Oh, it, what? 
and 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 our clerk uh, Bill Burgess is here, and uh, our sheriff, obviously Jason Myers, will be here for the town hall as well. Was there somebody else that I missed? Hey, oh, our district attorney. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Paige Clarkson. Yeah, and I, I just want to, um, so th there's, uh, I guess that would be all of our elected, oh, except for a treasurer, right? We have one, uh, Lori Steele. And Justice of the Peace. And Justice of the Peace. You don't want to see her either, right? Maybe. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we want to thank our elected officials for joining us tonight. And uh, with that, we will adjourn the Board of Commissioners meeting and we will open a town hall in the great city of St. Paul, Oregon. So tell them how it's going to work. So, and I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, uh, we're going to have uh, five presentations that, uh, in fact, I don't, as long as you, you can uh, hear them, it's probably better if they stand up as long as we can pick them up in the microphone. And I don't know if somebody's, uh, Trom, are you able to see if, if they stand up and talk as long as it's loud enough? Are they able to? Be able to pick them up in the microphone. Maybe they could hold them. We got that mic pointing in the audience, so if they just want to stand up where they're at, that's uh, okay. Cool. Perfect. And just so you know, you, we are being video uh, taped. This is um, our our board sessions are always. You can always watch them on CCTV, Facebook Live, uh, YouTube. Um, you can see more than you probably want to, uh, <laughs> but but it's always recorded. And then all of our meetings that uh, Commissioner Willis just read. If there's two or more commissioners there, that's why they're on the calendar potentially. And uh, our meetings that we have in our offices, those are all recorded and they're all public records as well. So anytime you need something, we're totally transparent about that. Okay, so town hall, is that good? What did I forget well, something? Well, they should tell the name. The oh name. yeah, when you have a question, if you can stand up and ask your question and just introduce yourself. Uh, you know where you're from. If it's outside St. Paul, if you're St. Paul, so tell them you're your, your home, um, and ask the question. But we're going to go through these five presentations first, which will trigger some thoughts. If you want to, if you write write them down or hold up a finger like I do to try to remember how many things I want to ask. Um, so we're going to start with uh, St. Paul School District, and the superintendent superintendent is here tonight. I hope. Maybe not. <laughs> He's probably the superintendent, the umpire, and no, there's a playoff game with Kennedy. It's legitimate. Oh, yeah, really? I'd, I'd rather be there too. So <laughs> all right. So we'll give we'll give him a pass. Uh, St. Paul Fire District uh, Chief Brian Lee. I know I met Chief yeah, earlier tonight. So Chief, if you want to come up and and just share a little bit about what's going on in the fire district and. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Brian Lee. I'm the fire chief of St. Paul Fire District. I've been here for about 13 years now. Uh, I oversee the operations of about 33 of your community members that are volunteer firefighters and EMTs. Uh, along with that, we do have a few um, part-time paid paramedics so that we can run the two ALS ambulances that we have to service you folks. We cover 38 square miles. I don't know if you guys know that, but uh, not only the city of St. Paul, but we go clear down to almost French Prairie and River, uh, the River, Willamette River to the uh, west and north of our boundaries, and then French Prairie. So we have a rather large district that we cover with uh, a lot of really dedicated volunteers of our, from your community. Uh, what's going on in St. Paul Fire District right now is the same thing that goes on every single year. We're getting ready for the rodeo. That takes a lot of our time. Uh, again, your volunteers donate a lot of hours. We're pretty much there from July 2nd this year to July 6th. That's our home. And if they're not working for the fire department, they're working for one of the other agencies like the JCs or whoever and still coming back for help, to help out with the uh, fire operations. So, um, the other uh, big issue that we have, I think everybody here knows, is that the tra traffic safety problem that we're having out here on McKay Road and, and along with the sheriff there, uh, I know I've gone before uh, a committee at the uh, Capitol to see if we can't get something through the county 
uh, so they can designate that area safety corridor with the hopes that maybe we can start slowing down some traffic and having less fatalities. We've had seven fatalities in the last year just in my district, and my partner over there who is from Aurora Fire District has had the same problem on their end on uh, Ellen Road. So, Elan Road, excuse me. So that's pretty much it. Um, I'm gonna be here for questioning, so there you go. Thank you, Chief. Yeah, that's great. Okay, we have our Veterans Services Office are here. James is here, right? Yes. Do you have anybody with you tonight, James? Are you sold? Guys. Oh, wow, great. Awesome. Okay, the whole team is here. So recently, and you can, you can, you're gonna share about the move and all that, yes. right? Great, so. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk about Marion County Veterans Services Office. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you, St. Paul. Um, I'm James Riddle, the Marion County Veterans Service Officer. Uh, here recently, we moved from uh, our first office, which was through the Arches Project, to our new home uh, about eight blocks south at 780 Commercial Street southeast suite 302 uh, we do walk-ins monday tuesday and wednesday from 9 to 11 and 1 to 4 that allows us time to catch up on paperwork uh, currently we're seeing about 100 people a week and uh introduce the staff here uh chris here in the center chris dyer he is our uh, front staff we call him the hub when you call or show up he's the first one you're going to see or talk to. Uh, Tim, uh, Tim Boykin is one, he is our, new, our oldest new VSO, <laughs> and uh, Eddie Granger is our newest new VSO. Uh, both of them are in training right now. Uh, we, we follow the training that the ODV, ODVA put out, and that is, uh, roughly a year long training. So these guys are gonna be with, with, uh, with me sitting, kind of shotgun watching how I'm doing things and then taking over on cases as they come along. Um, one of our biggest hopes is once they are fully qualified, getting out a couple days in the month out into places like St. Paul to help your veterans to the best of our abilities. Um, but again, we got to wait until they are fully qualified to do that. Uh, and again, commissioners, we wanted to thank you for the support that you have been giving us and continue to give to us. And we will be here afterwards if you guys have questions for us. James, thank you. Thank, thank all of you for your service. We really appreciate it. And I think uh, one of the things that you have been doing is getting out into communities. It's just not as often as we would like. But if somebody here knows somebody that can't make it to the Salem office, they can call and you can schedule a time potentially Absolutely. to come up and meet with them at a certain place. Are we ready to do that yet? Yes. Okay. We so have this may not that. be as quick as we would like it to happen. But True. So if you know anybody that's a veteran that needs some help getting benefits, et cetera, um, that's, these are the, the men that will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And you can ask questions here in a little bit if you have questions about that specifically. Okay. Uh, is Anna here from ODOT? Well, I just got here. Wow. Perfect. <laughs> wow. You're, you're, you're going to get hung up so, and entertained. So, right. Anna, we're, we're just in our town hall, and I had four or five presentations. And so do you want to... Do you want to speak just a little bit about the Aurora Interchange? I think that's what we had you here, the Donald Aurora Interchange. Yeah. And if you could stand right here by this table. Right now? Absolutely. <laughs> per perfect, perfect timing. So. I'm happy to. I have some handouts. Yeah, and you can put those on the table. How we're okay. going to do this is go ahead and give a present, you know, just sure. share, give us an update. And then we have one more presentation after yours okay. from, from uh, our traffic safety partners, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we're early. Um, my name's Anna Henson. I'm the project manager uh, with ODOT for the Aurora Donald Interchange project. Maybe you folks have heard about it. Um, maybe not. Maybe this is the first time. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what's going on with that project, and then I'm going to put a stack of flyers that we put together over here so you can grab one maybe on your way out. 
Um, there's only about 30 of these, so share if you can. Okay, so the Aurora Donald Interchange Project is um, a project that ODOT's doing to improve safety and operations at the interchange. Um, we're looking at two interchange types there, a diverging diamond and a split, um, sorry, SPI. Single point. Single point. Thank you, Keith. Single point interchange. Um, and uh, we, we received set $18 million of House bill money from the legislature to build a phase of that project. We don't have enough money to build the full interchange project, but we're going to do a design and then figure out what phase one looks like whatever we can build for $18 million and hopefully take care of some of the safety issues there. And, um, and then someday down the road, hopefully we can fund the remaining um, the, and to get the whole interchange built. So our plan right now is that phase one will be determined later this summer as we move into design. We're going to have an open house. We've had one stakeholder engagement meeting in April. We got a lot of input from the businesses around the area, and then we're going to have a public open house, and that information will be in that flyer on June 12th, and it'll be at the Christ Lutheran Church in Aurora from 6 to 8, and it's kind of a drop-in type of open house where you can ask questions, look at the alternatives that we're um, considering, and give your input, get on our mailing list, whatever, whatever you need to do. Um, let's see. Part of the project will, in addition to the interchange concepts or do something at the interchange, we're going to be realigning some of the local roads and working on some access changes on Elan Road. Ellen, Elan. I've heard it two different ways. <laughs> we're going with Elan, so sorry if I offend anybody by that, but um, that's, that's probably all I have. Uh, we also have a project website that you can look at to see information, and that is also on this handout that you can access. And this handout has the interchange options on the back so you can see some pictures. And I have cards if anybody wants to contact me. I'm the contact at ODOT for this project. Okay, Anna. And yeah. Commissioner has a special question for you. Okay. Well, this has been a project, and I'm not saying it isn't anymore, but up till now it's really been fast tracked. It was moving along faster than anything I've seen. Uh, I think the state, uh, local representatives, but I could tell that, I will tell that story. We had a meeting right there by the, I think it's Popeyes or something, and with ODOT, uh, different people from House and Senate and uh, talking about the difficulty, showing all the things going on under the overpass, the freeway itself, backing up, queuing out into the freeway. And it was just wild watching it, but true story. So they get all on the bus and they're heading back to Woodburn and they almost got hit in the intersection. So it's really moved it along. And <laughs> I'm hoping that that continues. Yes, so I thanks for saying that. We are on accelerated schedule for this project. Um, and we're, we're there, we're, it's happening. And our consultant is um, really doing a good job with that. And I think we're gonna make our deadline. So what, the way it's gonna work is we're hoping that construction of phase one, whatever that looks like, will go to construction. Well, we're obligating the construction funding in late 2021, which means they'll be like on the ground construction in 22. So it's, that's really fast for ODOT if anybody like, yeah. No, it's like when we started and to get to how, where we are today um, and pushing the two alternatives through as fast as we have with stakeholder and public, people have been so supportive of this project and so that's helped out a lot. So Thank you. Yeah. Thank You're you, welcome. I'll put these up here. And I'm sure there will be some questions. Okay, yeah, fire okay. away. And uh, Superintendent Joe... Uh, how do I say it like Joe? It's Worley. Worley. Okay. You want to come up and uh, say a few words, Joe? And uh, Commissioner said you were at 
the playoff game, but you're waiting for a text message, right? We're, we're down 13-6. Oh. to six. Oh. But stop of the seventh, and that's our inning. Last two games, Cheers. we've scored at least six runs in that inning. So Opposite of the Trailblazers. Uh, we're hoping. <laughs> um, yeah, good evening. Joe Worley, superintendent. This is my sixth year I'm finishing up. Uh, we've had an amazing run at St. Paul, uh, as many of you know. This year has been incredible because every team has made it to the postseason. We had uh, girls state championship, volleyball girls state championship, basketball, boys finished second in state in football. I'll get to the academics piece in a minute. But um, yeah, it is, uh, it's really incredible. Girls finished second in state in track and the boys are in the state playoffs right now in baseball so um, a lot of pride in the buckaroos uh, here in st paul and uh, it's it's kind of an amazing story the last in in my tenure here 2015 this community passed a bond and we combined that with seismic money and we're able to remodel our elementary school build an auxiliary gym and i'm sure that has something to do with the sports success um, and it, it has just continued. Um, we remod we got another second seismic grant and um, redid the high school gym, so it's beautiful. And being able to combine that seismic money with, uh, with bond money really m made it so that we were able to uh, not only make the school safe, but also beautify them as well uh, and put HVAC in and all those things. So the learning environment is, is really positive. Uh, OSAA does a uh, cup for this is the academic part that they award to um, boys and girls teams one at each level in the state and our boys and our girls will both win it this year we've pretty much locked it up our girls have like a 386 GPA average our girl athletes and our boys are around 37 so um, they are an incredible <coughs> incredible group of kids um, yeah, thanks. We're going to have some staffing changes, a new principal at the high school next year. But uh, Tony Smith, I'll, you'll, I'll say it here, maybe it'll be the first time. Uh, our current high school principal will be named in June as uh, the Oregon Small Schools Principal of the Year for the state of Oregon, uh, which is really a great recognition. There's 197 school districts in Oregon, 137 of them are small schools, classified as small schools. So. He was in the running against hundreds of other administrators and was selected because of his dedication to the students in the community here in St. Paul. So really excited uh, that he's going to get that honor. Um, our budget's done for next year. Actually, school funding for us, you hear a lot of negative things, uh, but we are um, we're staffed at about the right level. We're able to uh, invest money in curriculum and uh, in some infrastructure things that we still need to get completed. So I'm feeling really good going forward about where we are and uh, excited to be here again next year. So any questions you guys have? We will, we will get, well, we're gonna open up the questions after one more presentation. Okay. All right. Great. Thank awesome. you very much. Congratulations on your so success. Good, Thank you. Makes me want to move my grandsons here to go to school. <laughs> okay, our last presentation is traffic safety. Brian uh, Nicholas, our public works director, and uh, Commander Joe Cass, who is enforcement in our sheriff's office, and Sheriff Myers. Um, I do have, uh, I have a question to sort of tee up the discussion a little bit. Um, sorry, there's a column here. We'll kind of move around so you can see it. <laughs> And is it okay if we stand? Are you getting enough sound for a broadcast? Okay. Um, so there was a public meeting back in December organized by uh, Representative Post Office and some other folks. Would you raise your hand if you were at that meeting in December? It'd be, there was a discussion that started at that meeting that we're continuing tonight. So it's kind of good to know who was, about how many folks were in that discussion so we can know how, about, how far to backtrack in tonight's discussion to bring everybody forward. So, Sheriff Jeb. Introductory. Yeah. You want to make. So, uh, good evening. My name is Jason Myers. I'm your sheriff. Um, it's a privilege to be here tonight, and it's actually a great turnout. It says, speaks volumes to this community. 
Um, real quickly, I want to go back 30 years. In 1989, I was uh, the first one of the first summer park cadets for the sheriff's office, and um, I actually uh, patrolled uh, Commissioner Brentano's favorite park, which was San Salvador Park. <laughs> and so, <laughs> In doing so, I would come through this community, I would go uh, to um, Scotts Mills and patrol the park there, but I came to really love this community because I would stop in the SOAR and you're a friendly and welcoming community and obviously with your schools it just speaks volumes to how uh, much you're involved. Back during those times, there wasn't the traffic issues that we have today. We know that a lot of the cars are departing the, the, the highways, the freeways, the interstate system and they're cutting through uh, and traveling on your roads. Um, and so we partnered together with Public Works over the last uh, couple of years where we've had these town hall sessions, really focusing on the three E's of traffic safety. That's engineering, enforcement, and education. Our Public Works director will talk about the engineering side of the house. Um, Commander Cass is gonna talk about the enforcement and education parts that we've been participating in. That, maybe we'll start with engineering and then we can end with enforcement Sounds and good. education. Okay. Uh, my name is Brian Nicholas. I'm the Pub uh, Marion County Public Works Director. Um, so what I'll do is I'll give you a little update on some of the project work that we've been doing in North County. Some of it uh, around North County and then some specifically related to McKay, Jurgen, and, and Eland Road Corridor. So um, since December, I'll go ahead and give you the update since December. Um, We've, uh, among other things, we've installed a, a speed zone transition here coming into St. Paul on River Road. For those of you that were involved in that process, you know how long that kind of process can take. Uh, and at the end of the information I have to share, we're going to talk a little bit about potential changes to that process so that folks that were involved saw how long that took. There's um, maybe changes afoot that will change what we experienced uh, here on this speed zone transition order. Um, what else have we done? So, you know, um, like the sheriff said, we have a, we have a traffic safety team that uh, works together, public works representatives as well as sheriff's office representatives, and we talk about, we meet once a month and we talk about what are the road safety issues we're seeing physically on the road and what in a collaborative effort can we do to address those. So that's everything from what it is, do we think there's something, an issue being created by a lack of signage or insufficient signage or misplaced signage or is there, um, is there vegetation in the way that's blocking line of sight and that is a real concern. What, what can we do um, in, in collaboration, what can we do at Public Works to make the infrastructure better so that the sheriff's efforts are more effective on the enforcement side. So that, that team, we've been working together for quite a while now, and it focuses on roadways throughout the county, but in particular, we've been paying attention to McClay, Jurgen, and Elan roads uh, in the last year or so. So there's that team that uh, has been working together for quite a while now. Uh, just about a month and a half ago, uh, Public Works teamed up with ODOT to have a similar sort of collaborative effort, mostly just on the infrastructure side, about how we can manage Oregon 219 and the mcclay Jurgen eland corridor so that there's more continuity there. Uh, after the last fat fatal accident that we had on, Mc on McKay Road, you probably noticed a different response, uh, both from on the ODOT corridor as well as the county corridor. That's part of that coordinated response um, that we're working together to provide. So um, a little bit of a change there. Um, since December, that cooperative uh, working uh, uh, relationship with ODOT, uh, we, uh, ODOT installed some sign improvements, some intersection improvements at Oregon 219 and uh, McKay Road as part of uh, what was completed since December. We at the county level, we've completed an initial safety audit of McKay, Jurgen, Eland, the entire corridor from 219 all the way out to Aurora. So we've looked at a complete inventory of the signs, where do we see line of sight issues and other factors, other issues on the road. It's, a, it's the first step in a comprehensive study of where you have safety issues on a corridor. We've completed that effort, so we have a lot more information, a lot more complete and accurate information about specific issues on the road. So that important first step is done. 
You should have noticed uh, over the course of the spring here a lot of signs being changed out. So you should see, should have noticed um, smaller stop signs that are about three foot in diameter being replaced by four foot stop signs that are highly reflective. In fact, sometimes when you come up onto them, I have to shield my eyes because they are so bright. They are hard to miss, right? So we're going through and we're updating all of our signing uh, throughout our North County corridor. So you should be seeing the stop signs getting bigger and brighter. Rider signs that tell folks whether it's a four-way stop or not a four-way stop. So you'll see signs that say cross traffic does not stop. It tells you as a driver much more clearly what you're, what you're facing when you get to an intersection because it's kind of hard to see when it's really dark on a rural corridor, right? So that's part of what we, we've, um, part of the changes that we're making on our signing plans. We're adding more speed signs, uh, speed 55 signs on McKay Road. Probably the biggest uh, single improvement um, that we have in the hopper right now is um, the rumble strip program. So we've got rumble strips installed through a lot of the North County major corridors, not all of them. River Road is coming up. Uh, at least it's on a uh, ODOT funding list to, on the next round to do some rumble strips there. McKay Road, that one is under contract and is scheduled to be completed by the end of June. So that's not yet complete, but it's coming up uh, really, really quickly. You also see it, um, you'll, you should be noticing at, uh, stop, at stop intersections that the stop bar that's paved on the ground is getting a lot bigger and a lot brighter, a lot more reflective when you come up to it. So we're trying to really step up what, you, what drivers experience when they come to a stop, so it's really hard to miss the fact that you're coming up to a stop sign. So we're making those improvements, and then we're gonna watch and see if it's making a significant difference in crash history. And we have, we have our list of things that we will throw at it if, if we don't see a significant drop in, in crash activity. Right? Hey Brian, could you talk a little bit about the rumble strips? Just clarify yeah. where they are and why, and sure. that's a big investment. Yeah, 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 um, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so, you know, the rumble strips I'm talking about are the ones that are down the center line of the road. Um, on, particularly on McKay, Jurgen, and Elin roads, um, there are two predominant types of crashes that occur there, and one of the significant ones are what are called lane departures. So typically it's something like inattentive driving, somebody looking at their phone, somebody looking at something happening in, the, in a field or something like that, and they stray out of their lane, right? Those rumble strips give you a tactile warning. Your car vibrates and warns you to get back into your lane, right? So um, most of, well, most of the major corridors in North County, we've, we've gone through and installed those rumble strips. Um, we still have a few more to go, though. Like I said, River Road is probably the next big one. McKay is coming up in the next month. That's about a million dollar project. The program countywide was about a million dollars. That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. What about putting some flashing stop signs at the truck Good. stop there? The Good. truck stop, one out of three cars runs that stop sign there at the uh, Court and, uh, so, so you want to uh, just write that question down, and then let's come back to that, Brian, so yep. we can get through the, the final. But that's a good question, and let's make sure we, we come. Bend all the time. We have them all over there. And that's a that's a tool that we're adding to our arsenal. Uh, it hasn't been something the county has done much of in the past, but we are adding that now, right? So it gives you a sense of what we're doing, what we've completed in the corridor. Some of that signing, you're going to continue to see that improvement happening over the course of the summer. In fact, the job is so big, we're not going to have it quite done this summer. There'll be some additional signing improvements done in the spring. So that work is ongoing. What else are you going to see that's ongoing? Well, besides the rumble strips on McKay, uh, that same contractor will be installing uh, what's called durable striping at the center line. So we have a rumble strip. Um, center, uh, center line um, reflectors that help you track the center of the road. And we're installing a special kind of striping. So it's not just a painted stripe that you see on a typical county road. Um, it's a durable strip. It's, they're, they're, it's a thick material, gets melded to the pavement. It's highly reflective. So another measure that when it's wet in particular uh, and you get a lot of glare from oncoming headlights, it's another measure that helps you to see de definitely where that center line is at, right? So it's an additional measure that we're putting on McKay Road to help people stay in their lane. So when you 
implement safety improvements, you want to understand what the crash history is and then use techniques that address that type of crash. So that lane departure is a biggie because it happens a lot and the ramifications of an accident are significant, right? What about eliminating panhandles? That's just, can, can we just hold the question? Just, and I just want to get through the presentations and those are great questions and we want to hear those. So let's just get through the final presentation. Yep, thank you. Uh, you'll see a lot more vegetation removal on the corridor, so you'll see uh, there's some stretches of the McKay corridor where it feels pretty constrained by brush on the side. That'll be widened out over the course of the summer, so our brushing crews are taking care of that issue. Um, there's an advanced, sign, advanced warning system going on at um, Butteville Road and um, Elan Road because that is a high, uh, it's a high activity intersection. There are a lot of accidents that occur there above the normal number that you would expect. So that, that uh, installation's going in, and that is a summer of 2020 construction project. All right, finally, our Waymaster position is vacant, but we're working to fill that. So we can, once again, provide coverage, um, Waymaster services for these county routes that, um, that we suspect truck drivers are leaving the state highway system and taking the county roads to try to avoid ways, right? So that, that's in, in process as well. All right, so that's all the stuff that's happening right now that you're going to experience. I want to talk about a couple of things, two measures that are in that are on the horizon that would um, be helpful to know about, I think. So uh, Representative Post and some other legislators have proposed a House bill. It's number 3213. That is the House bill that would extend the, the, the jurisdiction that ODOT, the ability that ODOT has to create safety corridors. Uh, right currently, ODOT is the only jurisdiction in the state that can designate a safety corridor and implement a safety corridor program. Uh, this House bill, if it's passed, would extend that to counties. Um, there's actually, at 5 o'clock there was a work session, a le legislative work session, to work on some of the details of that. And there's a lot more specifics uh, in the current version of the bill than were introduced originally by Representative Post and some others. So I want to take a minute and talk about that because it's, it's kind of significant. Um, like I said, it, for the first time, would create the ability for counties to implement a safety corridor program. We've looked at the numbers on McKay Road. We've been studying this for a few months now. And McKay Road, definitely, if you compare it against the criteria that ODOT uses for establishing um, uh, a safety corridor, it would comply. It would, it would meet that standard. Um, one of the interesting things about the way that measure is drafted right now is it limit, well, it creates a pilot program to make sure counties, they go through a process to implement a valid safety corridor program that meets standards. So um, in that pilot program, counties are limited to one corridor as a pilot program. And that, this is draft legislation. It hasn't been adopted yet, but this is what the work session, that's what the work group is, is working on right now. Uh, McKay Road would be that corridor. For, for Marion County, McKay Road would be that corridor. So we're. We're taking steps to be ready to develop that sort of a program and implement it on the McKay Corridor if the legislation passes, passes as it's currently written. If it's, we're tracking it to see how it might, um, how it might um, be modified and, and you know, evolve as it works through the legislature. But um, McKay, like, I feel comfortable saying McKay Road is that corridor that we would use as a pilot program. So a couple things to understand about safety corridors they're purposely, they're purposely created to be a limited duration sort of measure. And that's something that folks, a lot of folks have a hard time with. Um, just philosophically, hey, if you have traffic issues, let's implement a safety corridor and make it perfect. Or they make it permanent, I mean. Problem with that is, well, when you make something like that permanent, it loses effectiveness over time. It just does. And the whole purpose of having a safety corridor is to reduce um, the, the number of accidents that occur on the corridor. So if a safety corridor is implemented and is developed effectively, it should el eliminate the need for the safety corridor, right? So that's one thing that folks would need to know. If the county enters into a safety corridor program, it would be a limited duration sort of measure. These typically are like on the order of four or five years, that kind of time frame. That's the time frame we'd want to designate the safety corridor and then make improvements targeting specific crash activity to make those crash numbers go down. Right? Um, however, what it does is it, um, 
it gives us access to some tools that we really don't have right now. Some of those are safety messages. Well, the biggie is enforcement. So um, uh, doubling fines on the enforcement side is a big, big tool that's implemented right away and that the Sheriff's Office can use while Public Works is doing its thing, improving the corridor. But what it also does is it lets us look at larger projects. We really don't have the funds to do it, to rebuild the whole corridor and put safety medians in and make it run like a freeway. Uh, but what we can do over time is do some significant projects. I put turn pockets on the main corridor at all of the main side roads. That would be a biggie, right? If vehicles turning had a refuge, they can get out of the stream of traffic. So we start to look at those kinds of projects. Some more significant intersection safety uh, projects as well. Some of, um, some of the other ones on the list, um, we could consider putting some slow moving vehicle turnouts to get slow vehicles and farm equipment off the road and let pa traffic pass, right? I mean, I think these are all things that folks see on the corridor that can be addressed under that kind of a program. Um, maybe shoulder rumble strips, so we're not just keeping people out of the imposing lane, but off the shoulder of the road as well. So we start to look at more significant systematic, uh, systemic improvements. That's what comes along with the safety corridor. So what I wanted to share with everybody here is, yeah, we're ready to take that step. If the legislation passes, um, there's a process. And when the corridor is implemented, it's a limited duration sort of thing. But if we do the job right, it should yield some significant We passed out of committee 11, 11 to 0 tonight with a dash three amendments. I just looked at it. All right. Good, good, good. One more engineering side. I'm sorry I'm going on, on and on. But <laughs> one, more, uh, one more item on the engineering side. So talking about speed zones. So um, to implement, the, install the speed zone here at the, coming into town, well, there are two things that, that are noticeable to me. It took about 14 months. Kim, that's about right, about 14 months start to finish, maybe to get it installed. Um, that's because there's an analysis and uh, some assessments and data collection that gets done. And it's part of a body of work that ODOT does statewide. So it has to get in the hopper, and then some work needs to be done, and there are guidelines and protocols that are followed. Um, that process took about 14 months. Doesn't always take that long, but that one did. So it's a pretty long duration. The other thing is, um, it's about a 45 mile an hour, right? You go from 55 to a 45 mile an hour transition zone, and then you drop down to 25. Currently, there's a working group uh, that in includes ODOT, and it includes um, the Oregon Association of County Engineers, and uh, a couple of other stakeholders. And that working group is looking at the methodology used in the state of Oregon to establish speed zones. Uh, and they're proposing to make some pretty significant changes. Some of them are, um, well, probably the most significant is, you know how there are statutory speed zones, like in a residential area, it's 25. In a business district, it's 20. That's in, that's in Oregon um, administrative rules. Well, if passed and adopted, some of the suggestions from this working group are, well, let's expand that and create some additional traffic speed zone categories that can simply be implemented based on context, not off of a lengthy analysis and data collection. So well, that, what I mean is, if you are transitioning from rural to urban, you're going from, say, predominantly um, exclusive farm use land to commercial, residential, industrial, that could be grounds to just automatically put in a 35 mile an hour speed zone. Right? So you don't have to go through that long, year long process to get a speed zone. That process is in committee. Um, it takes time to evaluate, look at all the trade-offs, see what kind of unintended consequences could come from those kind of rules, but it is in the works. So um, I'm hoping that in the next couple of years, what you're going to be hearing is adoption of those kind of measures that will really streamline those kind of processes. So, so we can say, yes, let's make something happen and let's do it on a quicker time frame. Right? All right, that's it on the engineering side. Sorry, there's a lot of detail there. But I'll be hanging around to answer, answer questions when we're done. If I could just say, um, the fire chief talked about it earlier. Both he and I testified in support of this House bill, as well as citizen members from this community. And I thought the testimony on the original hearing went very well. So I appreciate the fire chief supporting that. I think that could be a tool that we could use uh, for the stretcher road. With that, I want to have Joe talk about the efforts our office is putting into enforcement and education up here. Hi, my name is Joe Cast. I'm the Enforcement Division Commander at the Sheriff's Office. Um, and from the enforcement side, we're doing some saturation patrols. We've got some money, some grant money from the Oregon State Sheriff's Association, from ODOT, and then with our traffic team funds, 
We're doing some saturation patrols up here. And we did Monday and Tuesday of this week. We had six deputies working up here. They were working during the, I guess I would call it the rush hour, the morning commute and then the evening commute. And I've got some stats from that. They, uh, they pulled over 100, they had 106 traffic stops in, that, in those two days. They wrote 146 citations in those two days. And the majority of those citations were for speed. We're, and we're talking about the same roads. We're talking about the same area up here. The majority of those were for speeding. And those speeding citations ranged in, uh, in speeds from uh, 75 to 90 miles an hour. Wow. There, was about, there was 19 tickets in that category. And then there was a bunch, the remainder of the speeding tickets were between 68 and 75 in our 55 zones. So that was the speeds we were, we were catching people out up here on those two days. Um, there was a bunch of other citations written for suspended insurance and things like that as well, but the safety issues are those big speeds. Uh, and so that, that happened Monday and Tuesday. We're going to be doing that again this weekend on Memorial Day weekend. So you'll see, uh, again, I, I call it a saturation type of patrol, but you'll see that again this coming weekend, uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Um, those will be ongoing as we, as we get the staffing and the funds to do that. But this weekend, you'll see it for sure. Um, the other things that are going on on the patrol side, uh, on the enforcement side, we, our, our French Prairie deputy, the North County deputy, retired last, uh, last fall. Uh, that was Todd Bay. Many of you knew Todd. Yes. There's a new Todd in town. Yes. Yes. This is Todd Spoon. Uh, Todd Spoon will be doing that same position starting July 1st. He will be up here. And so you'll, you'll see him up here doing all of the same things that Todd Bay was doing and then all the traffic things and all those type of things. And he'll be working with the traffic safety team and working again with Brian's crew as well. Um, but Todd, Todd will be up here again July 1st. Sergeant Don Parisi is the sergeant that supervises all of our North County contracts and stuff. Uh, many, of you know, many of you know Don. He's going he's gonna to introduce Todd to a lot of folks throughout the area so that he can kind of get used to what's going on. And so going forward, Todd will be the one that gets more involved in the crimes that you guys are dealing with, the consistent problems that you're dealing with. And Don will help him get kind of acclimated and adjusted to that. On top of that, um, the media blitz, uh, we're going to start doing, we're going to be working with Brian's crew again, but we're going to start doing a, a more of a media blitz again about the safety issues and the speeds and the roads up here. And we're going to do it in not just in our local areas. What we're finding out in our in our uh, crash data and our citation data is a lot of these folks are not from these communities. They're passing through at high rates of speed, obviously, but they're, they're passing through from places like McMinnville, Newburgh, uh, Albany. Somebody, uh, somebody stopped somebody from Albany who was using River Road as a pass-through because they didn't want to get on the freeway, and they were cited for speeding for the same type of thing. So we're finding out that this media needs to go out further than what, you know, than what we might traditionally do and do it in the local community. So we're going to do social media and then traditional media uh, notifications and informational blitzes to make sure that we get that information out to folks as well. Okay. Uh, anything else, Sheriff? No, Your Honor. You know what? <laughs> hey. So, so uh, though, I don't know if you all know this, but our sheriff is retiring in June 30th, and we just are so appreciative of the work that he's done for Marion County over his 30 year career. Right? Yeah. Or more, whatever it is. Yeah. Thanks, Chief. Okay. You had the first question and the second question, so let's go after that question. Okay. It was, it was directed to Brian. Yep. Go backwards. Yeah. My first question. Your name? Is and just introduce yourself. My name is Ron Coyle. I have a, a residence very close to the truck stop. And there's a stop sign, a couple stop signs there, where one out of three people run right out into Elam Road. And I noticed over in Bend, I was over there this last week, and they have LED flashing stop signs. And uh, that would be a big help. <clears throat> Number two, the second question I have is to eliminate the panhandling in that interchange there. There was a guy playing the guitar out there, trying to drum up money, a traffic line clear back up on the freeway. You know, and uh, I know in Springfield and Eugene, they're ticketing the people who give them the money. <coughs> so. There you go. Fantastic. <laughs> 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 okay, well. 
we'll have to look into that. Do you want me to answer this? So that, uh, we don't have an ordinance like that um, in our county, so um, we wouldn't uh, be doing that. That actual piece of property we're talking about, I think, is the state interchange. Um, so typically we're not, I believe it's, those are the uh, um, areas that are open to folks to do that. I see it in Salem. That's not an area that typically we would enforce anything in unless they were jumping out into traffic or causing a, a problem that way. And then we have an ODOT property on the on ramp from Ealing to the I-5. Northbound or southbound? Northbound. Northbound. And that ODOT property is getting a lot of growth up in there. So homeless go up in there and camp. Well, I actually put up no camping signs up there. <laughs> You know, it's not my property. I don't want to see the waste of the crime from all that. So, and it yep, seems to have worked. We have a question here in your name, yeah. sir. Hunter Wiley. Okay. Uh, it's more comments than, and I'd like noted. Uh, regarding the new design of the intersection that's going in with the truck stops, we've seen the effect of basically escalating the load of traffic from the west end. Now we're going to see the load of traffic in the middle projecting both ways as major cutoffs, which the Sheriff's Department has documented that these, these, all these arterials are now becoming feeders into this corridor. If you look at your timing to get for the intersection appearing in, in what, 2022 or 2023? ODOTs, you mean the ODOTs? ODOTs. 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 Okay. Okay. So that okay. then is going to be in full effect pounding traffic through, even more than we have today. We know it's going to happen because we've already seen what happened with the bypass. This is going to make this an even easier corridor to pass through. So the safety corridor that you have, or you recommend it, certainly, you say it's going to last five years, it may not last five minutes, uh, given the excess loads of traffic that, that are going to be through there. ODOT did not predict the amount of loads that were going to go down the cable. In fact, as they said, there would be no additional traffic. One of the things I'd like to see is the county, which does that traffic monitoring, Publish their own statistics. Okay. okay. Uh, we, it actually, we keep a database and um, and we can make it public. There's no reason why we can't. Make on it your public. website or something. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we have it on our internal website. Let me double check and see. I think we might have access to it on our external website as well, but I'll double check. Um, okay. You, you've, given, you've given yeah given me some things to right. think about there. Next question. Chris, it's the time of the year that we're moving white equipment out here on the farms. And uh, recently we moved equipment from, well, the other side of uh, Lone Elder down through Aurora all the way over to Newburgh. And you pointed out more turnouts are needed. Unfortunately, in the notification of warning people about the dangers of McKay Road, uh, some of those turnouts were taken by reader boards. Yes. Yes, and I, I was going to point out that uh, we do need those turnouts, or people are going to be flipping us off more than we've been. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We were fortunate to only get flipped off a few times. <laughs> but, well, uh, yeah, there's other places on the shoulder we the, can set those. The Newburgh Bridge sense. one, for example, that's very important. There's, I can just go right down the list of where we turned out and where we need to turn out. And we try to, we, we keep flaggers on both ends. We try to move equipment safely. And uh, because of that, we, we pull them off on the shoulders even sometimes where it's not too good for the equipment yeah. or the safety standard. And um, it's, it's helping people move. But down through these creek bottoms, I've pointed out that, that we need signage that uh, all farmers need to flag their loads because there's a lot of us that, uh, are out there not using the flagging and they need to be using it or they'll be giving their farm away to somebody someday yeah. or somebody's survivor. I, I'm going to be talking with our sign shop and make sure that they know those variable message signs that um, we like to set up in the turnouts because it's real convenient and it's flat. We'll move those off to a gravel section of shoulder so we don't great, great. We don't take those up. Uh, and then I'll We'll need to do a little bit of work on what options we have for specialty signing for bridge crossings, but we'll look right into that. Right in the front row. Okay. Yes. Uh, Hunter, what's the name of the corner? I call it Banker Smith's Corner, down by you. Oh, French Prairie, Prairie. McKay. Okay, French Prairie 219. I want you to go home that way and then cut yeah. over. You will see that I think there's 
three cars from different directions that all have the right of way. It's, yeah, it, I've never been to a corner like that, and it's been like that for years. I asked, yeah. Nothing's ever changed. I know, I've always asked if that's how we support our fire department. Well, I will do that. <laughs> Hi. Um, I think Tom's testimony oh, here, uh, my name is Ann Wiley, is a perfect example about how uh, ODOT, Marion County, need to consult with the farmers and the landowners who are along that corridor who can make positive suggestions before something inadvertently happens that curtails their work and their business and their livelihood in our area. This is a farming corridor. It used to be a farm to market road yeah, it years ago. Road. It still is a farm to market yeah, road unless it's been changed. But not consulting with the people who work along that roadway and have property along that roadway is short-sighted. His information right now is Germain to every single point along that corridor. I Thank you. Yes, yes sir. Dan yeah. Keeley. Um, I was curious, have you guys considered uh, safety edges on the cave versus the, the uh, uh, rumble strips? I, we had some luck with those years ago. Um, safety edges, some. As in the pavement is beveled down to where some of the accidents that I've responded on up there have been, oh, we hit the gravel edge and the tire catches and they yank it back and then they head on the truck, whereas the safety edge allows them to pull back on gradually without so much. Whenever we do a structural overlay on a section, we put a safety edge on it now. That didn't used to be common practice. We've been doing that for about the last four years. So you're going to see that slowly change. We hit roads with a structural overlay maybe every 15, 16 right. years, right? So that's something you'll see change over time. But, yeah. Yes, sir. Kevin Smith, if it's a couple of the places that you're talking about, so you can understand what from people that live in this area and use these roads several times a day in both those places. The three choices that I have in mind when I'm coming south from Wilsonville direction are mostly I use the hover cut off now. Don't everybody do that. <laughs> <laughs> But if there's more than five cars already in the margin at the Donald exit, I go out to Woodburn. Yeah. Because any time that you're sitting out there, uh, kind of a dead duck, when the semi goes by this far from your left ear, about 70 miles an hour, it's kind of <laughs> hard to handle. Yeah. Um, right here, right next to us, this four-way stop is maybe the best thing that's happened in this town in my whole lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yes. However, if you've been driving these roads, you know, three or four times a day for 50 years, it's hard to get it through because there's a muscle memory there. The one, the one question that I'll have about it is coming from Newburgh, so coming south on Main Street, the stop sign, the new stop sign, one of the two new ones, is quite a ways off of the road mm -hmm. because it's at the very back of a big wide new sidewalk. And I think it's too far away. I think it needs to be up closer to the highway. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'll share that with with. I'll share, yeah. I'll share a muscle memory. When we were walking across the street today, I told I told Commissioner, I said, "Watch it when we go across here, because one of these directions doesn't stop." <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're talking about. And I looked up, and I looked up, Cole, and I go, well, "They all gotta stop now." <laughs> But they, but they may not for a little Exactly. Little. When, I was, when I walked across there, and I'm listening to this traffic fly by behind us, and I'm going, right, to the stop sign. It sounds like they're going pretty fast. So, yeah. Anyways, other, anybody else? Other topics besides traffic? Do you want, don't you want to hear about Still something? Still about traffic. <laughs> I don't know why we can't put some stop signs on the K Road so maybe we would slow down. We used to have stop signs in different directions. I was on the, I worked for the company that put McKay Road all the way through. And I worked with the estimator and he called constantly to Marion County and complained. He was, he didn't like the way it was going. Sure enough, he said, somebody's going to die. It was a 19-year-old girl who worked for my mom at the Donald's Cafe who was killed right off the bat. Your signs are great now. 
before they said caution McKay Road, which meant that Shampooey Road was a freeway. Yeah. And the guys in their their brakes on those semis was horrendous. I couldn't believe how many semis I was seeing. Um, my kids farm on French Prairie and McKay Road, and they've almost been hit I don't know how many times already. Um, Shampooey State Park is a nightmare. Those people do not stop at that entrance. They just come right out, and I don't have a signal on. I'm not going in the park. I'm driving down the road. And that's a real big problem on that road. Well, there's, there, there's, you know, well, it's one of those things that's hard to talk about. Um, our entire system of road safety is based on pave out a flat sheet of road that's comfortable to drive and then paint stripes on the ground and expect people to stay between the lines and follow the road rules and be predictable. I mean, that's how all, all of our safety, and we're implementing nowadays some tactile things that give you some warning, that give you, give you a sense if you're being distracted or you're not being attentive, it gives you something, you know, they'll jog your attention. But at the end of the day, that's what a lot of it is. It's a sign, and we're expecting people, everybody, all the time to obey the signs, to follow the lines. When it's a double stripe, don't cross the line. And that's becoming less, it's becoming less common. Uh, so like never before, it's more important than ever before to drive defensively. There's some stuff that I just don't have a practical engineering measure to prevent people from doing. So we all have to, I mean, that's kind of the community message is we all need to be driving defensively. Um, but I, I will, we'll take a look at some of those situations. Well, signs go on the K Road, if they can be back, like on Case, you know, right there at Case Road, that's where we've had guests. Um, I guess it's Buteville Road right there. That one would be great if they had a four-way stop. It would so, slow those people down. So I, I, do, I do want to address that question. So the question of um, there's a there's a there's a corridor and it and the, and it looks as though it ought to, to the driver's perception it ought to be a three way it just looks like it it has the right alignment it's nice and smooth um, it looks like it ought to be a go straight right through and not stop come to a T intersection it's a different feel right to stop at the intersection sorry and. Um, but but I, do, I, do, I do need to address this because it, it is a very common question. Why can't we put stop signs and four-way stops as a traffic calming measure to get people to slow down? That will move it, over to the next road. Well, no, yeah. worse than that. Um, it is shown through research very, very conclusively that you will increase serious accidents if you do that. You put a stop sign in a corridor in the alignment that looks and feels to a driver like it ought to be a through, you put a stop sign, you're going to have fatal rear end crashes there. It's a fact. So we have to be very careful about how we implement traffic coming measures. So that, that's, unfortunately, that's not a tool that we have at our disposal because there's unintended consequences. But it doesn't mean we can't look at other measures. Brian, speaking for a few I would comment to file away to this lady's point about traffic diversion. I don't recall seeing traffic counters laid out on the roads around Buteville, but Shampooey has become a diversion from um, McKay, Jurgen, and Okay, Allen. good to know. And yeah. the amount of traffic going through Buteville, which is not designed for traffic, right? It's not even designed for market marketing, it's just really poorly designed. But the, amount, the volume of traffic going through Buteville, we're, we're scratching our heads on what we can do on quarters like that. Um, I don't have good solutions yet, though. Tracy? I've mentioned this in the past in a couple different meetings, uh, both at uh, Donald Fire Station meetings and some forth, that um, the What is wrong with the roundabout? It slows you down, all the traffic keeps moving, it, it flows constantly, you could flat, there's so much room at the end of McKay. None of those people stop going toward the river, not one of them. They will pull out in front of you with maybe two car lengths, they don't care. You're doing 55 on the corner, they don't care. They're pulling out in front of you because they have to get home or wherever they're going. So you flat out McKay Road, right at that end of that big intersection, there's there's tons of room there. You could have a two-lane roundabout that would flow. 
St. Paul people would keep coming this way, the other people would go that way. I mean, it would just flow. And then if you did the same going to Donald off of McKay, same thing. You got this nice steady flow of traffic, that, and it's especially if the big intersections are going to change in Aurora and it's going to make people get on that road faster, then you've got this flow all the way from the freeway all the way to the bypass or wherever they're going. All the way. I just don't... I, but it does. We were, I were in New Zealand for two months and they do have a smaller set of satellite trucks. But they, they constantly had semis going through those roundabouts all the time, and they, everybody flowed. I mean, you want to add, you want to talk, because that's been part of a design yes. that we've looked at over a longer term period. Well, but, right. Can I comment first? <coughs> Well, let, let, well, Brian, it's up to you. If you want to answer the question? Let, let's talk about roundabouts for just a second. Um, I'm a roundabout proponent. Um, bottom line, it ends up being something about dollars because they are the most expensive initial cost. And they do have a big impact on the adjacent property. So there's trade-offs. Every engineering solution has trade-offs. And intersection design, there is no perfection. There's always trade-offs. Um, the, well, 219 is a state highway. ODOT routinely looks at roundabouts. It is definitely part of their arsenal that they look at on a routine basis. One of the challenges with roundabouts is um, there, just as there are folks that are passionately and supportive of roundabouts, there's probably just as many that are passionately opposed, and it takes time, and time is money, to work through those kind of questions, right, to make sure it's the right solution at it. Given location. So Brian, the reason so. we can't do roundabouts is because Commissioner no, <laughs> <laughs> certain how to get out. Okay, this nasty is lady you guys are honked at me. Yeah. Yeah. My comment about they can't handle the heavy traffic is if you go to Europe and you see freeway entrances and exits, four lane roads, side streets coming in, and they'll be handled by roundabouts. Yeah. And they also will do signal assisted roundabouts in the same race for extreme traffic loads during the heaviest times. Believe me, Europeans have figured out they work, they can be designed, they work, and they take no maintenance. Now, I know the regional director of ODOT, using Forest Grove as an example, which is probably the most expensive design you could ever do, doesn't like roundabouts. I think that they, they I know they're expensive. Well, I don't know um, that anyone in, a, in the traffic industry, the transportation industry, is opposed to them, but they understand the hurdles of being it's a cultural thing. It takes There's a bit of culture in whether you accept that as a traffic solution. So, um, so I, very good points. Um, it's not as easy to implement because you've got to go through that process and get stakeholder buy-in on what your solutions are going to be, right? In some ways, it's easier to do the try. Even though I know when I install a signal, it's going to be only be good for maybe 15 years and then I'm going to have to upgrade it. Uh, and a roundabout might have a 50 or 60 year performance life. It's still sometimes it's just way more receptive. Folks are way more receptive to say right here. Mm -hmm. Your name? Oh, Judy Fisa. Judy. Sorry. And uh, it, uh, my husband has lots of beaver chance, so he's traveling down through the and up to the same way all the time. Why can't there be at least a flashing light, stopping light, you know, going north and south, and yellow light going east and west? Uh, it's very dark out there, especially yep. at night. Say the location again. Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, um, I thought we installed one on the stop sign, so I'll double check that. Okay. We'll, okay. We'll take care of that. Okay. Right, right, right here. First, and then we'll go to you. Go ahead. Nice fixes of the which are really good. So, Brian, can I make a comment? 
the three commissioners uh, actually wrote a letter two years ago. We actually wrote a letter two years ago to say that the number one transportation project for Marion County was in Yamhill County. And it was the completion of the Newburgh Dundee bypass. They made a big error, a huge error, which cost us in our community by not completing that. Well, we did get some, I think the money's in there for the right of way. They're working on buying the right of way. So that was the biggest issue, is to complete that Newburgh Dundee bypass. That's the only long term answer that, that I thought of, by the way. But even that scared me. They did another dirty thing there. I'll just tell you, you may not know. Well, you're, you know, Ann Lawton. But the one I'm talking about is. is to, uh, designing that to not use Wilsonville Road to get back to the uh, freeway. A dirty, rotten <laughs> trick. And I yeah. tell you, I found out about it at a, at a traffic meeting. The Newburgh mayor, a wonderful guy, Bob Andrews, uh, and he was talking to somebody else. said, oh, you had a great meeting, nice agreement last night. And I said, oh, what was that? When I found out what it was, I threw a fit. I got calls from Clackamas County chair. Well, don't mess it up. We have such a nice agreement. I said, we're the ones affected. We're not even in this agreement. So the plan, so that all that traffic that could have gone straight to Wilsonville, the by the nice horse bombs and everything, doesn't go. Can't even get there. So that that's the kind of stuff we work on, but we can't win them all. That was a loss. I think I had one over here, and then we'll come back. Uh, for the Bankers Corner one that I wanted you to go out, it almost sounds to me like that could be 2025 before anything. Is that true? You have all these projects lined up, and. Whoever brings a, something up, it goes to the end of the line. No, um, just because something is freshly, newly learned doesn't mean it's okay, lowest priority. Because that one's extra dangerous. I'll take a look at that one. So some of this, you know, like we talked about, if you're here in December, you learned that at the December meeting, I hadn't even taken <coughs> the uh, public works director role. So um, I'm about five months in, and I'm still learning a lot okay. about our system. So, hey. um, so forgive me about that. I'm a huge proponent of enforcement. Um, we and my question, I guess, would be for the sheriff's department with your saturation that you did in our area. Can you relate a decrease in accidents? Because when you pointed out the speeds, we live with those speeds constantly, and it's terrifying. But I'd be real curious to know, if you have a saturation for two or three days, can you, through talking to the fire department or, or you know, can you document that I'm hoping that you're going to say that there were less accidents in that period of time? I'm sure the presence helps to reduce accidents, but it's um, one of those things that it takes this, we got to look through a multitude of lenses when it comes to traffic safety. And enforcement is one component, but these other components are as equally important. So uh, that's that's my answer one. Answer two, to be able to have somebody dedicated 24 hours a day, seven days a week in one stretch of road is really difficult for us. So well, we can focus our efforts. There are other roads in the county and there are other calls that we have to tend to. So we try to, we try to work together and really look at it through those three lenses uh, when we talk about traffic safety. I hope that answers your question. You know, I've never noticed that you guys put the speed trailer ever out on that stretch. Maybe that would be a part of a solution. It's a so great idea. Help yeah. with the enforcement portion of it. Well, and helps. We, we garner data from the speed trailer that we can actually give to Brian and his folks as well that it's been used to help inform some of these interventions that they have. But one thing we didn't, we didn't uh, go back to, because we did it last year, but we um, enacted, the commissioners enacted a East Salem Public Safety Service District, and I don't know if we talked about this when we were up here before, but as a result of that, because East Salem was taking 50% of all the deputies' calls over there in the unincorporated area of Salem. In fact, if you incorporated East Salem, it would be the <coughs> second, second largest city in Marion County. And it's unincorporated. The Sheriff's Patrol is doing that. So we enacted an East Salem Public Safety Service District. We have 10 deputies in some part of a process right now that are going to be in addition to the uh, Sheriff's force. So that'll help with allowing deputies to be out. That's going to take a while. It'll take a year to get that all up and going. So we didn't talk about that tonight, but that's another thing that will help on the education and enforcement side. Which there's a question kind of hanging there that I don't think we really adequately addressed. That is, when the interchange is built out, so the Aurora Donald interchange is built out and it's 
operating at higher capacity, what are we going to be, are we going to be ready for it, right? Particularly on McKay-Eland and uh, McKay, McKay Jurgen Elin corridor. Um, the way that process works is we maintain a rural transportation system plan. Um, I'll tell you the plan that, that I inherited is about 12 years old. So it is outdated. We're in the process of updating that right now. And that's when we start to take into account what's happening in and around our system so we need to be prepared. A little bit, little bit of perspective, the annual uh, gas tax funds that we get that are dedicated to road use so we can apply on the roads. It's about what's needed to maintain the existing infrastructure. Very little in the way of improvement, other than small improvements like new signs and striping, and those kind of modest improvements. When it comes to building, hiring contractors to build significant improvements, that takes other sources of funding. So our transportation plan tells us what we need to be prepared for, so then we know what the costs are going to be, what, what we're going to prioritize and focus on, what the costs are going to be so we can go out there and get that funding. So we're Frankly, we're early in that process. That's the, that's yeah, the question here. Thank you for your patience. Sure. Uh, I'm Celia Rosemeyer. I live on Bent's Road, the infamous Bent's Road. And we come in right at the intersection there of I-5 and um, Ellen Road. And um, when there's an accident on the freeway, our road becomes the freeway. Mm -hmm. Everyone heads to the freeway and then they head down. And we, we always know, we can hear it in our house, it's going zoom, 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 and because they're going freeway speeds down our road, and they keep going, and then they run and they block up, trying to get across the river, so they're coming out of the Charbonneau exit, and they're blocked clear up on Boone's Ferry Road, all the way up, and so we feel like we have no way out. I mean, if we have an emergency, we're sort of stuck, we can't get out, unless we, you know, get our own helicopter or something, it's almost getting to that point, and so I don't know what the answer is, but I-5 itself, is, has become more accident prone than anything. I, I mean, it's just constantly stopped. I mean, we can see it across the fields, and it's just stopped all the time with an accident or something. No. Every Sunday, it's stopped. If you live on Bent's Road, I encourage you to attend the next open house that ODOT has for the Aurora Donald Interchange Project. Some, uh, like I said, they, uh, like Anna said, they only have four, uh, about $19 million in this first phase to work with, but some of the low hanging fruit addresses Bent's Road and can make things better. Uh, it would be good to hear what they're what they've looked at and provide your input to them. Okay. That, that's sure. the most immediate action. I got a non traffic question. Yay! Where's <laughs> my where's my prize? I'm gonna go sit down. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Scott Ryan, St. Paul. Uh, I've been on the budget committee for four years, and uh, over and over again, uh, a problem with the city of St. Paul getting grants is that we're told by that our average income is too high uh, to qualify for grants. Uh, the average income is, is figured on the zip code, 19137, uh, which takes in a large area. Is there any help the city can get from the county as a part of the, of the census coming up, which has income questions, that we might get a more realistic figure uh, of the average income for the city limit for St. Paul? You know, I, at least at least is still here. I don't know how the census is broke down and, and what that data does, but we certainly, did you hear the question back there? Yeah. We'll, we'll take a note and see how that census impacts the, the city versus the surrounding area, the zip code. Uh, I think Commissioner mentioned in Idana, for example, uh, that just got, I think they got a million dollar grant for a water system for a, a we water. Use that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, took, it took us almost five years because what happened is the COG had to go back and they had to revalidate the study because their income was way up because it was probably one person that, really wealthy, you know, really wealthy person and everybody else didn't participate in the in the census that year. So we had to go back and there were some ways to get around that uh, through some actual data. And But it took us a long time to do that working with the COG and IDANA and now they got their grant and they're getting a new water uh, system put in this summer right now. So we'll, we can work with you on that. And our community services department can help too as well as the board's office. So we need to work with you and talk to you about that. Brian Oxen, board here, Donald. I just want to say thanks to the Sheriff's Department and the County Commissioners for 
reinstituting the North Marion County Sheriff up here. Yes. Um, I know you guys are shorthanded um, with personnel and all that, so I really appreciate the efforts to make sure that you guys are covering the area up here. Um, so I just wanted to say thanks for that. So I just had a, I wanted to make a comment um, about traffic in this area and the um, infrastructure needs. One of the things that we, Commissioner Cameron and I were back in D.C. and our top ask for our federal delegation was money for transportation infrastructure in this area. Um, and I think Brian's highlighted, and I've been seeing just how difficult it is um, because you have multiple government agencies and the funding that we need to actually fix this, we don't control, right? The, the state and the feds actually control that funding. And so um, I'm just, I don't know what's gone on before, but I'm really grateful for the work that Brian's done to kind of start it together. And one of the things that I really appreciate about what he does is he looks for ways that he can make things better, right? It may not be we can solve everything, but every little thing that we can make better, we will. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that you all knew that and to continue to call us and email us and harass Brian because I've been very impressed with how responsive he is on the things that he can accomplish. Well, and that, and that transition center happened as a result of an email that came to the board's office. That started, whatever, two years ago, I think, right? I mean, you, you weren't, maybe you weren't even here, but I remember that trend and, and every once in a while, I'd get an email saying, where are we? Has it happened yet? Where are we with this? Where are we with this? And, and it does matter that you, you know, you continue to give feedback. And I just want to say this, tonight being here, listening, and getting this feedback from you. <laughs> getting this feedback from you matters to everybody that's here, matters to us, but it also matters to these the individuals that are here. Uh, you know, the, the Sheriff's Department, the Public Works Department, and there's several people from Public Works, brand new operations uh, manager for, division manager for our Public Works Department started yesterday. He's here in the back of the room listening. And I'm sure Brian's going, next time you get to get up here. You know, <laughs> so my point is, is that we really appreciate your input and that, that you, this community especially really cares about what's happening up here. We can't control we can't control Metro, we can't control what's going on up there and all the traffic and some of those decisions, but we will do the best that we can to, to try to implement the changes that make a difference. Like I said, that East Salem Service District, th those people are going to start paying uh, per household $120 a month. I mean a year, excuse me, $10 a month. <laughs> We'd like to sell you some of that. <laughs> But when we went to them and asked them to do, we, we, we brought this proposal to them saying, we could hire 10 deputies, which gives you two deputies 24-7. It takes five deputies to run seven days a week 24-7 with vacations and all that. We can give you 10 deputies for your community for $120 a year. Gee. All right? We figured that out. We took it to them, and guess what? You think that's a good deal, don't yeah. you? Right. So the point being is, is, is that we will find solutions and work with you to help find those solutions. Sometimes it costs money to do it, but when you know you're going to get this for that, it does matter. Versus money that's going into the big capital down, excuse me, I better be quiet. Uh, uh, so, so we really appreciate that. And, and you know, some of the things that Brian, the, the things that Brian's going to take away from tonight, I, I'll tell you, this group will be in, in with us in a work session saying, Here's what we heard, here's what we're gonna do, here's what our priorities are. And, and I know just from two years ago, Sheriff, you and I, and, and uh, I think some others were up here, Sam, you were here two years ago, and many of you in this room, and it, it was uh, not a lot going on, but since then we've really, really tried to move. And uh, we, to see Todd Bay retire because of his situation was, we love that guy. I just saw him bowling Tuesday night. He wasn't bowling, but I saw him just miss guys like that. But we got a new Todd for you. So um, it, it's great to be able to, to be here with you and, and um, see things change. So we, got, we, got, we got three hands. Just one. We got, the guy in the hat was wait, first. All right. I'm just going to close out with a satirical comment about this road situation. Uh, a fellow asked me, what do you think you own the road? when we're trying to move machinery. And as a matter, as a matter of fact, farmers do own the roads. They, uh, 
they basically, you'll see it on their titles. If they own both sides of the road, they, they own that road. Maybe, from a satirical standpoint, maybe it's time to take the roads back and put a toll up. <laughs> Yeah, it's McKay Road. Yeah, I just if you have a Marion County driver's license, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one here and then here. Okay, I'm uh, potting like with the Historical Society, and it'd be nice. <laughs> I have uh, a particular hope, and so far there's improvement, but not much, and that is our park down at the bottom, which was once re referred to as Brentano Landing, and is now called <laughs> San Salvador. They know a story that I'm not going to tell you the whole thing, but that, that, that particular place has been important to me and my family for generations. Yes, Just leave yes. It the Brentanos are very stubborn about <laughs> So just so you know, we, we had burgers over at the Rodeo Inn tonight before we were in there. Our whole public works, or half our public works directors, there's six of them came in and they said, he whispered in my ear, guess where we were? Were you down there? Yeah, they were checking it out. <laughs> well, checking the it thing out. is, Sam's family used to want to run a wonderful garbage uh, outfit. And when I go down there, it's sad. Who owns that park now? Fishing game. Fishing game. Fishing game. And we're, state park. We're, um, both. we're looking. Brian, do you want to? You want to? You want to say anything about where we're at? With Don't that? make promises, but it's Don't make any promises. <laughs> Under promise, over deliver. So well, tell them the whole story how there's money available at this time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so we are definitely looking at this. Um, Russ Dilley, our parks coordinator, is not here tonight, but he's um, viewed the site before the flood, after it was flooded. So we were down there tonight actually taking a look see at it as, as a potential park for Marion County. Um, we have some opportunities uh, with one of our urban parks that we're helping out a, a school district and we're selling that. So we'll have some funds to possibly acquire some property. So we're kind of using it as an evaluation. We're looking at it as an option. So. Like and we do. <laughs> down there. Yeah, I, I understand. Like that idea. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking more of a gate. <laughs> well, we, we can work <laughs> on that. So, yep. All right. So. Right. Speaking of controversial topics, you're, you're, you're right here in the front. And then we'll go back. We got right here. Right. My name is Velma. I'm a resident of St. Paul. I guess this will be a Brian question. I don't know if you can hear where you are. So Monday night, this happens constantly. We're still talking about the main strip right here. We have one crosswalk that's mm -hmm. been potentially just designated, which I remember when that came in, I couldn't believe it, that crosswalk. Um, so Monday night, we have the budget meeting. We leave. Car zooms and slams on his brakes right at the stop because, oh my gosh, I gotta stop. But in the meantime, we have a couple people trying to cross over, and no one's stopping for the pedestrians. <coughs> Why do we have a rule we should have a rule for well, this net didn't used to be a four-way stop. Now it is, so maybe that's something we can look at. Um, I think so. Yeah, let me look it's at it. I, I don't have a good answer for you. I mean, we can park well, here with well, a lot of cross. They don't stop because right? you can hear the traffic. Right? Right? Okay. We don't have the right to, to walk yeah. across without people afraid of yeah. getting hit. Um, we're looking at ways that we can enhance, particularly school crossings and the functions of the school crossing. Mm -hmm. So um, we may have a solution in the next year or so. Okay, way back in the back, Ben Patient. Bill Weinstein, I live on Jurgen Road. I want to set the record straight, first of all. You have McKay Road, Jurgen Road, Ellen Road, and to Aurora. Not Elon Road. Everything 
State of Public Works is doing to improve the conditions out here with your signs, the rumble bars, they wake me up. That's okay. They wake the neighbors up, but that's good. The other thing is, the bottom line is enforcement. You can put up all the signs you want. If you don't have the enforcement for it, these people traveling through here, they don't live here. I mean, they're, they're, they're foreigners. They don't pay a bit of attention to them. It's a hazard out there on McKay, Ellen, Jurgen Road, Buteville Road, Boonesbury uh, Road, all these roads. It, it's a waste track. I saw two cars the other day, right past uh, my place on Jurgen Road. They were racing. They were doing 90 miles an hour, boys. I can believe it. And I know. I'm a professional driver. 32 years. Before that, I was a policeman. I can spot them miles away. But the only thing that's really going to put a stop to this nonsense is enforcement. So somebody's going to have to kick through with some money so that we can get more police out uh, here to do the enforcing. Thank you. Uh, just we got four, four minutes to eight, and we'll stay longer, guys. Well, we'll just I just take, take 30 seconds. So along the line of enforcement, enforcement I appreciate the fact that manpower is limited. Um, can they do photo enforcement? That uh, we've never explored. I believe we need the county ordinance <coughs> to do something like that. So that would be a question. It seems like they're doing away with all those when they do put them in, don't they? The trend is amid, most jurisdictions that adopt it eventually amend it significantly or abandon it because of legal challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Marcy, can you tell about the cemetery celebration, Memorial Day? Oh. Yeah, I can. I don't know the program, but um, we're having a, a Memorial Day, our annual Memorial Day celebration at our new cemetery, which is on Church Avenue going east. Uh, this Monday starting at 10.30, and this year we are um, honoring uh, the Civil War veterans. Mm -hmm. And we will also be dedicating the new flag. And giving a tour of the Murphy House. Yes, <laughs> and the, after the uh, ceremony, the, uh, there will be those of us over at the Murphy House, the uh, historic house, where everybody wants to come for a tour <coughs> until 1.30. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, just sir. about one month after that, 41 <laughs> days, we'd like you to come back here for Rodeo Week, Little May 4th Bob. Annual St. Paul Rodeo. Yeah. I was here last year, had a great time. Good. I saw you in the parade. We think if we had one every week, there wouldn't be so much traffic. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't, get around all, couldn't get around all the horses. Well, you want to say anything in closing? No, I've enjoyed being here. I always, I always do. This is still home to me and uh, it's fun to see the faces and the issues I'm but I'm sorry I, I we didn't talk about garbage it's terribly important to the to the county I know there's issues right now just to let you know that we're uh, Kevin's actually working this year harder than any of us but trying to protect what we think is the best system in the United States and it's threatened right now um, but the traffic I've worked on I know it's impacting you uh, and, and I'm hearing it again but I, I think you can tell it isn't for lack of us trying and coming and you hear Brian the different ideas. Um, we're trying to make it as good as possible, holding on until Newburgh Dundee uh, is, uh, goes back and back the way it's supposed to be. And uh, still working on Wilsonville Road, uh, dirty bums. Anyway, uh, just happy to be here. There are projections, Sam, on how long that's supposed to be before that's finished. Well, like I mentioned, they got the right-of-way money. That's what we worked on. I, oh, this is a true story. I just testified about a month ago with a group out of Newburgh, uh, Yamhill County, to try to get to keep it moving along in the legislature. And while we were testifying, there was another accident, a fatal one here. Um, just as I was saying, how many accidents they have. So I wanted to send it right over and say it's just never-ending, and, and we've got to make it a priority. Great. I'm sorry. Do you Politics. No, they didn't want them on politics. their road to keep it nice. It was all, it was all politics. Don't get me started.
Do you want to say anything, Commissioner? No, no. Hey, you've lost right. control. So we are going to adjourn. Thank you very much Thank for being here tonight.